to you from the bunker this is watchtower in focus episode 26 the show that zooms in on all things jw bringing the governing body and its teachings and policies under microscopic scrutiny if you are watching this episode on august 14th then you are watching it on the very day that the new that the new york child victims act legislation goes into effect Among other provisions, New York has opened up a one-year window in which survivors of abuse have the opportunity to file claims against any organization or person who contributed to the abuse of a victim. Watchtower is headquartered in New York and right out of the gate, heading up what is expected to be a flood of lawsuits from all 50 states, the organization's legal nemesis, Erwin Zolkin, is filing several lawsuits in which all eight members of the governing body are named as defendants. Joining me to discuss this incredible development is ever-present co-host Mark O'Donnell. Filling in again for Covert Fade is friend of the show, filmmaker Javier Ortiz, and I am delighted to welcome our special guest to comment firsthand on proceedings San Diego and New York attorney, Erwin Zulkin. So, Hi. Mark, Javier, and Erwin, thank you for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. Good, good, good to be here, Lloyd. So, Erwin, it was just remarkable watching the press conference yesterday. How validating is it for survivors to be able to speak out in this way and pursue watchto- Watchtower over what happened to them? But Lloyd, I think it's extremely validating, and it's it's uh, a way of feeling empowered. You know, uh, for so long, people feel victim victimized, or they feel like they're a victim. They they don't know what to do. They're ashamed. They're embarrassed. They can't come forward. It's very difficult to do that. Uh, but once you cross that threshold, and when you come out and you can speak publicly, and you can do that in front of the media as Heather Steele and uh, Michael Ewing did yesterday, um, it's extremely life altering. They they were both telling me how they just felt so strong and suddenly felt so empowered and uh, just different. It's a different state of mind. Sure, and Mark, you've been following this case. Were you uh, interested to see the uh, this window of opportunity pounced upon so quickly? Yes, I, I was, and um, but I think that um, Irwin and his team have certainly done their due diligence in representing survivors, and I, and I really feel that um, he and his team take a vested interest in these people, particularly the two that did the press conference yesterday, and that was um, Michael Ewing um, and uh, Heather. Um, and I wanted to say that, um, you know, and maybe Irwin can, can comment on this, but um, very impressed with the fact that Michael started off his section of the press conference by describing the impact that the not only the abuse had upon his his life but the the impact that the abuse had upon his all his behavior beyond just the abuse meaning the abuse caused him to take up drinking and as a coping mechanism and he was involved in some drugs and and what what is worse he was victimized twice and um maybe erwin can comment on this but what what i saw in that interview with both of them particularly with michael was um that this man had not only been victimized by a child abuser but he had been disfellowshipped for homosexual activity by the congregation, which drove him further down into, I guess, a depression and uh, behavior that made a bad situation even worse. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, with Michael, his situation was that he was, obviously he came from a very, very committed and devout Jehovah Witness family. He himself was 
uh, it felt that his future would be to become an elder. I mean, he, he wanted to, uh, that was his path that he was, he was choosing to, to follow. And to that end, uh, he was put in his father, who was an elder, had connected him with the abuser, Michael Rust, who was a single male and seemed to have this uh, a, a good relationship uh, uh, with children, with young boys, uh, mentor type relationship with young boys. And so his father felt it was appropriate for Rust to, uh, to mentor Michael, Michael Ewing, uh, his son, and uh, become his Bible study teacher and uh, help him to, you know, along the path to where he wanted to be, which was eventually, hopefully, to be chosen as an elder. And so he, he completely trusted this man. And this man would use religious text and, uh, and to groom him into engaging in sexual activity at the age of 14 years old. He would talk about how he has now reached puberty and this is normal and he's going to sort of teach him what he needs to know and what he needs to understand about sex and, and that sort of thing. And he would uh, engage with, uh, show him pornographic materials. And, and then it led to uh, very, very aggressive sexual conduct between them. Uh, Michael thought this was the normal thing. Michael thought this is what, what he had to do, what happens. Um, uh, until at some point when he was 21 years old, uh, and the, the abuse stopped when he was about 17, but it, it, at around 21, he, he, he started struggling as a teenager. He started to get the idea and understand that this was, that was not normal and this was hurtful to him. And he started drinking and he started taking drugs to bury the pain. And then when he was 21, he, he reported this and told uh, his, his father what happened. And his father said, well, we need to go to the elders. And he did, and it was a judicial committee. And the upshot of that was that he was this fellowship, as was Mike Rust, but he was this fellowship for engaging in homosexual activity, as if though a 14-year-old kid understood and consented to doing something that was obviously um, considered to be a sin. You know, th that's, that was the problem. That, that betrayal, when, they, when he went to the elders and he's telling the elders the story and this pain, uh, that he has been suffering for years then, by then, uh, the response was, well, you know, you deserve it. You're, you know, you were engaging in homosexual activity. You need to be disfellowship. That was really hurtful to this kid. And to this day, I will tell you to this day, he still considers himself a, uh, a Jehovah's Witness. He was reinstated at 22. And he considers himself a Jehovah's Witness, and he find, it, there's a terrible conflict in bringing a lawsuit as, a, a, and making that decision to do that. But he feels that the organization needs to be cleansed of this. You know, they, they do consider themselves or want to consider themselves as a clean organization. Well, this is not clean. The, the abuse of children is not clean. So he, he, if his commitment is to cleanse the organization, he actually sees us as, as helping the organization. Javier, uh, just bringing you in, we've seen a number of uh, lawsuits down through the years, many of which, in fact, have been brought by uh, Irwin and Irwin's uh, firm. But never before have we seen the governing body listed as defendants in a lawsuit. How surprised were you and, and what feelings did you have when you saw that included uh, in the press release? Yeah, I was, I was happy to see that. Uh, I was surprised like uh, everyone else. Uh, a couple of fist pumps uh, when, I, when, I, when I heard the news. Um, and, you know, just it, it comes to, to your imagination goes off and you want to envision these guys on the witness stand and having to answer direct questions and not being able to, 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 to dodge or skirt it or just release some kind of blanket statement. I, you know, the, the, uh, we abhor child abuse. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we get to, we get to witness that on, 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 you know, publicly, uh, these guys, uh, uh, having to answer questions and, uh, and Irwin, uh, you know, sticking it to them on the stand. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this. This is good news, but more importantly, it's, it's good news for the survivors of the abuse. So I can't wait to see what happens next. Indeed. Um, Erwin, I, I have to ask, it, it does seem 
a little bit too good to be true to think of the governing body actually being called to account for their policies in a court of law. Um, do you anticipate that it will come to that, or do you think that they may try to squirm out of, of again, calling being called to account in that way? Um, well, I, I think they have a legal, they're going to have a legal obligation to uh, at least appear in a, uh, at a deposition, which is out of court testimony that we can take in a civil case like this in front of a court reporter and um, answer questions. Uh, they are now going to be named defendants in a lawsuit. Uh, they are uh, headquartered in the state of New York. They direct all of the activities of the uh, Jehovah's Witness organization from the state of New York. Uh, they are very hands-on. The governing body is very hands-on in making policy and practice in the uh, uh, for the organization and issuing directives to elders, including directives relating to their sexual abuse policies. And so uh, I think we're going to have uh, the ability uh, to, uh, to proceed against them as defendants and to take their testimony, uh, whether they appear, whether they ignore court orders, as they uh, have done in other contexts, is, uh, will, what remains to be seen. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it if they do, but uh, as of now, I think they're going to have to answer. It would certainly be nice to see them answer. I'm just a little bit skeptical because certainly, was it in the Lopez case, uh, Garrett Loesch um, issued this remarkable statement disavowing any connection with, with Watchtower. They really are willing to jump through considerable hoops when you are asking them to produce information or produce uh, individuals and they simply don't want to let that happen. Is there, is there a chance that this case could end up, uh, that they could end up losing the case by default simply because they, they refuse to acknowledge um, the requests that are being made? Uh, well, that, you know, there, there are any number of, of sanctions that a court can impose if they refuse to comply with court orders, uh, monetary sanctions, or in, in, uh, in some cases, uh, their defense can be terminated and a default judgment can be entered against them. That, that's a risk, uh, I think, that they face if they don't want to or if they decide they want to refuse court orders. Yeah, Erwin, you mentioned a, a default judgment, and that's very interesting because up until we started discussing the JW versus Watchtower case, which we covered last week in our Watchtower in Focus, um, not a lot of people were aware that a default judgment had been issued in that particular case, and I believe it was in excess of $4 million, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Watchtower appealed that case multiple times all the way up to the California Supreme Court and lost every one of those appeals and now has reached out to the United States Supreme Court. Um, so, you know, first of all, the default judgment, it, it's, a, it's a lot of money and obviously they're paying a lot of legal fees in association with that because they have some outside counsel involved. Um, now they've reached the Supreme Court. Um, maybe uh, we know your time is limited, but uh, maybe you could give us just a very, very brief summary of why they're in the Supreme Court uh, with this JW versus Watchtower case, which they've already lost. Yeah. So they've, they've filed a, what's called a petition for a writ of certiorari. That's the legal term. And they're basically asking the Supreme Court of the United States to uh, address the issues they've raised, uh, which have to do with their right, uh, First Amendment rights to uh, the free exercise of their religion. They feel that this, uh, the, uh, the requirement that they produce these molestation files interferes with their religious practices. Um, they are raising issues of the fact that they're claiming that there's a uh, some uh, a level of disagreement among courts in the in the country on uh, the, the the obligation to produce these molestation files and that sort of thing. Um, the problem that they have, Mark, is they didn't raise these issues at the trial court level. 
uh, and or at the appellate court level. If they did at the trial court level, they abandoned them at the appellate court level. And so there's a there's a requirement that the Supreme Court has that you can't come to the Supreme Court of the United States with an issue unless you've litigated that issue and given the state courts their fair share or their fair opportunity to weigh in on the on the issues you're raising. If you haven't done that, then your claim you you can't you have no right to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's premature. You have to allow the state courts that opportunity, which they didn't do. They're they're trying to make the the U.S. Supreme Court the the court of original we call it original jurisdiction, the the one that first hear this stuff. You can't do that, and that's part of one of the reasons for our opposition. And on the merits of it, they just don't have a basis for this claim. There's no uh, the, these these files are being produced under court protection. They're not being made public at this point. Uh, there's uh, th this happens all the time in all kinds of contexts. You we have corp in the corporate world. There are companies that are forced to produce their trade information or trade secret information in litigation that's under court protection and can't be disseminated. Uh, so th th there's nothing special here. Uh, other than they would like to make it claim that it's okay to protect molesters. There's some First Amendment right to protect child molesters. And, and we just, there is no such thing. Owen, if I were to just play devil's advocate for a moment um, and, and repeat some of the arguments that we do here, watch how I make in these cases, they seem to want to argue that what the elders get up to um, is really not none of the business of Watchtower, that they are essentially their own free agents and Watchtower and certainly the governing body can't be held accountable for what elders get up to. They also seem to make the argument that what ordinary congregants get up to who aren't elders is again no business of Watchtower and no business of the elder body. How do you answer those sorts of objections? Uh, it, it, you know, everything that happens within the organization starts at the top, and uh, the the even the an elder doesn't just become an elder because an elder wants to be an elder. An elder is selected. An elder is there is a uh, request made to the watchtower to approve the elder as in that position. And ultimately, the approval comes, and it says so on the documents that appoint the elder. That it's a, that el that appointment is is ultimately approved by the governing body. So, and they control the conduct of the elders. They issue directives through what are called body of elder letters, uh, and other processes that they have, where they have meetings and so on. When the, uh, and and elders are given instructions on how to conduct business, so to speak, for the organization. So they are agents of the watchtower. They are agents of the governing body. And as agents, their conduct is, they are accountable. Uh, the, the organization is accountable for the conduct of their agents. And, and that's true even at the congregant level. So it, unlike other types of uh, religious organizations where congregation members are uh, voluntarily join and they, they appear, they come and sit in the pews. Um, there's no real regulation over them. That's not how it works within the Jehovah's Witnesses. You don't become a publisher, uh, a baptized publisher within the organization until you go through an education process, until you are uh, tested. You have to go through a testing process by the elders and then you're ultimately have to be approved. And then you're authorized once you're, uh, you, you, you pass those, that test and that vetting process, then you're authorized to go out and perform service work on the organization's behalf. So you are an agent and I, I, I analogize it to back in the old days when you used to have door to door salesmen that would come selling vacuum cleaners or uh, encyclopedias uh, those were agents. They were sales agents. And if, some, if they did something to they hurt somebody, they, they were, the organization would be responsible. So it's a very similar situation here. It's a different construct than uh, they would like to, you know, they use the construct when it helps them. They try to differentiate themselves from other religions when it, uh, it helps them 
Otherwise, they try to say, well, we're just, you know, we're a religion like this other religion. I, I, you know, they, they try to make it work in all different directions. It, they're very inconsistent. Erwin, do you feel that their dis <clears throat> their decision a few years ago uh, to only allow circuit overseers to appoint elders has anything to do with what's taken place in these cases that you're filing, which largely are things that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago when elders were directly appointed by the governing body. Now they have direction that the circuit overseer is the point person or the person accountable for directly appointing these elders. Well, I think it is, I, I think it would be an effort on their part to distance themselves a bit from uh, the relationship, the, the, the more direct relationship with the watchtower or with the governing body. But, you know, it, it's, it, they're delegating a responsibility to an agent that operates under their control and their direction still. So I think that uh, from a legal standpoint, it, it, it's not going to help them a whole lot that, that a circuit overseer is undertaking that responsibility uh it he's still he's still operating on the behalf of the organization he's not just some individual who on his own uh makes decisions and uh just has no responsibility he's making the decision if he is it's it's on behalf of the organization it's Erwin, I, have the a, I have a question for you the benefit of the organization uh, we talked a little bit uh, before about uh, uh, Garrett Loesch and his refusal uh, or you know, trying to dodge uh, 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 replying to a, a subpoena. Deposition. Deposition, okay. Um, in, in these cases that have been filed, what's the potential impact of, of being able to call uh, a governing body member to the stand? And, uh, and how would it affect other cases uh, uh, that haven't been able to do that? Well, I, I think that, it, you know, these are the, the, the people who set policy. These are the people who have been enforcing policy from the top down through to the congregation level. And uh, it's important to understand uh, how they justify the decisions that they are making when it comes to how they handle reports of child molestation and what uh, what it is that uh, that is driving these decisions and how it is that uh, that they can't change these decisions when they see and when they know the depth and the breadth of the problem of the molestation of children in their organization this is you know this is an organization that has been maintaining a database of this information of known child molesters for decades and, uh, and to this day, uh, they still are re requiring that the congregations and congregation elders report to the CCJW or to the service department, which is now basically run by the, uh, the congregation, the Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they, how do you answer to that? You, you know, you're, you're the top of the, you're the you're, you run the organization, you, you know this exists. Um, how is it that you don't have policies in place that, uh, that take into account the data of information that you know about how molesters uh, access these kids, uh, how they are being uh, dealt with when reports are being made, why law enforcement isn't being told, why Child Protective Services isn't being told. There's a lot to answer for, and uh, I look forward to to talking with these governing body members about that. I, I imagine that when, when you're preparing for, for, for all this stuff, you anticipate what the response might be or um, how they might try to avoid being called to testify. Um, can you tell us a little bit of what you think that, that, that approach might be? Well, I, I'm, I'm prepared that they're going to be sitting there with the, the Bible. <laughs> And that they'll be return. They will refer to scripture uh, at, at virtually every question, which uh, is something of, a, of a, a little bit of an annoyance when you're trying to get to the bottom line of a question. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we just have to wait and see, uh, Javier. We just have to wait and see what they do and how they respond. And and you know, we're we're. I'm very patient, and I'll be sitting there and taking 
whatever time is necessary to get my answers. Uh, and so, you know, they can, they can obfuscate, they can try to avoid, but uh, it, uh, if it takes days, as it did with Richard Ash, uh, who I previously was, uh, cons uh, they, they presented him as the person most knowledgeable about sexual abuse policies within the organization. And uh, it, took a, it took some time and some effort to get through with him because he would do the same thing. He would answer, try to answer my question by pulling up the Bible and reading scripture to me. Uh, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll see. It, it, it'll be interesting. Uh, Erwin, uh, just returning to this particular case as well, uh, because obviously um, Heather and, and Michael uh, are going to be represented by you. Are you able to give us any idea of the time scale of the lawsuit? In other words, r over roughly what period we can expect this lawsuit to reach some kind of finality? And do you also know anything about how many other lawsuits might be filed, bearing in mind that any state can file because the headquarters are in New York? All right. So in terms of uh, the time frame, um, because there are, as an, it's anticipated that there will be uh, maybe, you know, a, a thousand or more lawsuits filed of all kinds uh, within different organizations under this the, the New York Child Victims Act. Um, I anticipate having talked with other lawyers and now having seen some court orders that have been issued, uh, one by the chief administrative judge and so on, uh, these cases are likely going to be coordinated in some way into some coordinated proceeding. And they're going to be managed at least until the time of a trial uh, in some organized fashion. So. Um, I don't anticipate, I don't know, I can't really answer the question of how long this is going to take. Sometimes a coordinated proceeding like this can actually be more efficient and could take less time. Uh, on the other hand, it, it could also be a, a little bit bigger of a, a management issue and, and take a little longer than maybe a singular case. Um, so I don't know. Uh, the People who are filing these lawsuits in New York uh, that are coming from out of state and um, have cases in other states, as we do with, 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 with respect to Michael Ewing, his case, I mean, a lot of what his congregation was in Florida, so, but he was physically abused at Bethel in New York. So uh, there's a, a strong New York connection, not just the fact that all of the direction and control and retention and did you say he was physically abused in bethel at bethel and in, in wall kill yeah good yeah, grief at the farm right yeah. yeah so uh so you know we have uh that it, 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 it this is going to be a tested issue for people who are bringing cases where the uh congregations are out of state where the abuse occurred out of state and they're suing the new york in new york um this is going to be a tested issue i think it's one we'll win because uh, we can show that uh, all of the direction and control and decision making and so on that uh, emanates from the uh, the New York based headquarters uh, and the governing body, and uh, th that's where the negligence or a good deal of the negligence occurs. <laughs> In previous cases, Erwin, the, uh, such as uh, Lopez and Padron that ended up settling, um, as well as with JW versus Watchtower and many others, um, the issue of the database came up. And we know that you can't discuss the contents of the database. Um, but is it fair to say that the issue of some or more of those database files will come up in these newly filed lawsuits so that you, you again are asking Watchtower to produce those same documents or maybe the documents within a specified period of time? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is look, we're, we have to show what this institution knew. You know, they're going to claim that they've done everything possible to address the issue. They've issued um, articles in the wake. They've issued articles in the Watchtower. I just read one of their responses to a news article is that they've, tr they've tried to educate parents and all this. So 
they're going to take a position that, you know, we've done everything possible to uh, alert people, to uh, train parents, to be uh, careful and uh, on alert for this kind of thing and all this stuff, you know, so they're going to, they're going to say, what do, you, what do you want from us? What more do you expect from us to do? We can't, we can't watch these people 24 seven. I assume that the, that's the kind of stuff we've heard in the past. Well, you have, if you have a database uh, that goes back decades, that describes how children are being accessed, that describes the inac inadequacy of your programs, your, your responses to reports of child sexual abuse, and you don't implement policies and procedures for fixing that problem, and kids are still getting abused because of that, then that forms the basis of a negligence claim. And so we need to know. I mean, that's a critical issue, and it's one we're not going to abandon by any means. And we are going to pursue it in every venue, in every case that we file against these guys. It's safe to say that for every minute that Watchtower is keeping these records under lock and key, which name perpetrators, name accused pedophiles, there are children who are at risk because these individuals are on the run. Uh, do you think we, we can see, the, do you think we might see those records finally turned over to law enforcement in our own lifetime? Well, I, I certainly would, would hope so. And I think the more attention that's drawn to this, the more... It, it gives law enforcement the, the understanding of how critical this is, you know. Uh, it, it needs to be, this needs to be exposed. You, you know, there are molesters that are not on the run, Lloyd. They're, they're not running from anybody. They're walking freely among congregants. They're knocking on doors of unsuspecting members of our communities. Uh, they're not running anywhere, they're being protected. And th that's, that's the crime of it all. I mean, they're being protected. Indeed. Well, the work that you're doing is certainly bringing us one step closer to the day when justice can really be served and children will really be protected. I'm mindful of the fact that your time is very precious and you're doing loads of interviews right now. So I'll, I'll steer the show towards its conclusion. And what we normally do is just go around the panel and ask for concluding comments but what we'll do is we'll ask um, for concluding comments and concluding questions from Javier and Mark. So if we begin with you, Javier. Sure, I, do, I don't have any questions, uh, but uh, you know, like I've had the opportunity to interview Irwin uh, on a couple of occasions. And uh, I, I, it's always been clear to me uh, that his motivations have been sincere, but I did see the, uh, the program that aired uh, uh, yesterday uh, and uh, and I saw your reaction to one of the questions about uh, uh, you know how does it feel uh, knowing that uh, those documents exist and that you can't speak about it. Um, so if there's ever any question as to what motivates you to do this work, I hope we can point to that clip and 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 that will put all doubt to rest. Um, so I, I am certainly grateful for all the work that you're doing. And I'm glad that uh, that you take the time to talk to us about it and explain these very complicated legal things in in, in layman's terms and uh, for folks like me uh, and a lot of people who are interested in these cases to understand. Uh, and so my only request to you is, if it ever comes to be that you get Anthony Morris on a stand, you please please reach out. Let me know. I will book a flight. I will be on the first flight to wherever that may be. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll be there rooting for you, just like we are from, from far away. So please. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. It's a long way for him to fly, only to face me in a wrestle for who gets to the chair first. But there we go. Um, and Mark, do you have any concluding thoughts or questions? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Erwin, for being so sincerely devoted to helping survivors of abuse. We, we know that... Um, you're not doing this, you know, for self-gratification, that there are truly sincerely injured people out there. And if your law firm and the others don't represent these people, I think the organizations that cover up this abuse will continue uh, 
uh, unfettered in their um, shutting down these victims of abuse and continuing these, what I would call religious abuses of authority. So thank you for doing that. And um, I also want to thank you for something you said in an interview with um, another reporter. And that was when you discussed uh, that you actually went to Watchtower's attorneys, and I think it maybe was uh, Mr. McCabe, and, and following one of your cases, and you offered assistance to Watchtower because you knew there's a problem. You knew there's a lot of lawsuits coming. You said, look, let's, let's help you fix this problem. Maybe we can work something out. And can you, can you tell us um, a little bit about what happened during that exchange with Watchtower's attorneys? Uh, sure. So after we settled a, a, some cases very early on in, uh, in our work in uh, lawsuits against the Jehovah's Witnesses and litigation against Jehovah's Witnesses, we're still a little young and a little naive in terms of what drives the, the, this organization. Uh, I said, I actually approached uh, Jim McCabe, who was formerly an in-house counsel. He was now working out as an outside attorney and Mario Moreno, who was the in-house counsel or one of the in-house counsel for the Watchtower. And I said, look, you know, I understand. I, 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 you have a set of beliefs. Um, your conduct uh, is, is uh, or the conduct of, in, in how those beliefs are being translated, I think violates the law and is, uh, is a problem, is going to continue to be a problem. But there has to be some way to find a middle ground, some way that it, without offending your beliefs, you can still comply with the law and, uh, and avoid this problem and mitigate against the harm that's being done to children. And I'm willing to sit down with you or with whoever it, it would be a, 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 the person to talk to or people to talk to and try to come up with some way of bridging that, that gap. And uh, I, I, they, they, they were not receptive to it at all, so. I, I, we did actually interview you. I interviewed you a number of years back, um, Irwin, and you actually said, our goal is not to destroy the Jehovah's Witnesses. They may think that's what we're after. We are really after trying to get them to change what are really just antiquated and dangerous policies. And when we resolved our first few cases with them, one of the things I asked their lawyers, and Mario Moreno in particular, was, what can we do to change this so that this doesn't keep happening and he looked at me and said, we're never changing this. So here we yeah, are exactly years later in the same situation. That's exactly right. You, 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 you got it right. <laughs> it's been a long time ago. It's almost 20 years ago that that happened. So. But you yeah. haven't given up and you're still at it. And uh, yeah. I, since it's my turn for concluding comments, I think I'm uh, expressing what's on the minds of many who are watching this in in just wanting to thank you for your persistence. Um, it's safe to say that you have a long distinguished legal career behind you and there are other things that you could be doing at this point in your life than pursuing uh, justice for these survivors and trying to protect children moving forward. And the fact that you're sticking with this despite the complexities, despite the heartache when you read these stories and when you interview survivors, we, we know kind of how draining it is just to hear one story, let alone the dozens that you must be uh, hearing. Um, we, we really do salute and admire the incredible tenacity that you have. And, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you guys too for the, the continuing coverage of this, uh, not letting go of this and making sure that uh, voices are being heard, people are being heard, the stories are being heard. And to me, it's just a privilege to represent survivors. You know, I, it just, it, I, I couldn't think of anything else I'd be, I'd want to really do. I, I hate golf. I really do hate <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's just thank as you well you hate golf. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you also to Mark and Javi for this special episode of Watchtower in Focus. Thanks. Good to be here. 
So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. But for now, thank you so much for watching.